the art of the picture book and how a picture go book gets made. My name is Larry Swartz. I work at uh, OISE UT, Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, where I teach teachers and I've been involved with language arts, drama, and teaching children's literature courses. And we have a panel that gives us different perspectives about the creative process. We have Keo McClear, and she's a author. And, and wait, wait a minute, you're gonna get your moment. <laughs> and Catherine Cole has had many titles. She's an editor at Second Story Press, and she has also been in the book publishing industry for many years. Ian Wallace, author and illustrator, with many books. Some of you will see in the back table. And we also have Michael Solomon from Groundwood Press, and his role is the art director. So we are gonna uh, phrase some questions. You're gonna hear from each of these people. We'll give us a different perspective. And of course, we love your questions too. The first question I ask is a typical one we ask in children's literature courses. And uh, it, it's the hard question. So dig back into your past and since we're talking about picture books, I have a book called Everything I Need to Know I Learned from Children's Literature. Can you talk about a book from your past that inspired you uh, in life, in reading, and for the art of being involved with books? And we'll start with Keo. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So um, I want to be able to give you something really imaginative and interesting as an example of a book that inspired me. But really, the two books that inspired me, the first one was the Richard Scarry series, Busy, Busy Town, um, just because it had this encyclopedic detail. And I grew up in cities, and I was from a multiracial home. And just the idea of this interspecies kind of you know, a life of people getting along, being boa constrictors and foxes and like, it's like actually terrible uh, anthropomorphism, and when I look at it now, I kind of shudder, and a lot, there was so much racism in it, but I, for, as a child, I just loved the detail, and um, I also loved, um, the other one is The Selfish Giant, which was about a magnificently kind of cruel and selfish giant who becomes generous, and I think what really drew me to that book was the idea of a child knowing more than a grown-up and teaching the grown-up, and um, really, I think those stories have really stayed with me. Well, mine, mine isn't very imaginative either. Um, there were two that really came to mind first when I was first asked this question. One was Make Way for Ducklings, which is going way, way back. But uh, delightful, mostly black, um, black and white illustrations, just highly animated characters in those animals. And I, was, I think I was a visual learner more than an audio one, so the pictures always got to me. The other one I brought with me, um, nobody will have ever heard of it, I'm sure. It's called Artie and the Princess. Uh, it was published in 1945 in the States, um, shortly before I was born. And, and um, it's a story. It's, the story didn't stick with me at all, but the pictures did. And when I was a teenager, they kept coming back to my mind all the time. And I kept thinking, what was that book? And I tried to find it in libraries and I looked all over the place and couldn't, finally gave up. But when we were moving from my parents' house and selling our family home, I found a box up in the attic and guess what was in it? And um, to my astonishment, the illustrations that I remembered looked exactly how I remembered them. So it, it wasn't one of those things where you think, gee, that's not how I remembered it. So obviously these illustrations had something to stay in the mind of a child and there's a, a great deal of craftsmanship and and wonderful line drawing in this book with um, a very sweet quality to it and I think that's what appealed to me the most. Um, the book that uh, touched me deeply as a kid and uh, certainly now, even today as an adult was one that has become controversial and that's because of the inherent racism in the story. And I was a four-year-old reading that book. I didn't understand that aspect. Uh, the story just thrilled me. And the book is called The Story of Little Black Sambo. I admired Sambo, and I loved his parents, Jumbo and Mumbo. And uh, in particular, I was really engaged in the story. It was thrilling. This little boy who bit by bit and piece by piece loses uh, his clothing until he's just standing there in his underpants was thrilling as a four or eight-year-old. Um, 
and the and the story of the tigers really captured my visual and literary imagination. Uh, today, I can't look at um, a stack of pancakes without thinking of all those tigers that had bit onto each other's tails and then raced around that uh, magnificent palm tree. Thrilling story, great characters, and brilliantly told. If you look at the language in that book, there isn't a word too many or a word too few. Each one has been carefully chosen. And the illustrations perfectly match that text and their simplicity. And there's this kind of lovely graphic quality of them. And even in that graphic nature, um, the, the jungle was huge in my imagination. It just enveloped the characters, but as much it enveloped me. And that's what that, a good book should do. Um, I'll pick uh, two as well, uh, one from my childhood and one from adulthood. The uh, early one was uh, Lavender's Blue, uh, Famous Mother Goose. And um, that book just was, uh, I, I mean, it, it captivated me in so many ways. I was really impressed that it could, um, that truths about the world could be told in verse and song, uh, even sometimes sort of horrible truths. And the book was also visually a kind of, um, aesthetic education for me, but even more so is I took it very authoritatively. I read it sort of encyclopedically so that all of these kind of uh, ominous things that are out there that you might have to look out for, like a crow as big as a tar barrel, and there was the illustration to prove it. And these illustrations have nothing close to realism, and yet I took it as a documentary kind of fact. And I think that was kind of an early taste of really seeing art as instructional and um, explanatory. And then from uh, much later in my career, I would name uh, Zoom and Rezoom by Istvan Banya because of the, uh, they're wordless books, but they have an incredible sense of a voice talking to you because of the linearity of the focus, the, the, uh, the constant linear drive of the changes in focal length. So each page turn has a kind of um, reassuring but also surprising um, factor. So that every time you turn a page, it's sort of like, Yes, of course, that's what I would see next, but also, wow, I didn't think of that. Or sometimes it's a kind of balance of the two. So I really like that kind of purely visual storytelling that's reassuring and surprising at the same time. Thank you. I say it's a hard question because there's a whole repertoire that we dig into in our uh, memory banks and um, what are the criteria for choosing them. But it's a question I invite you to think about. And if this was my classroom, I'd love to hear your choices. Anybody want to hear mine? Just say yes. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, the one that comes to mind is Madeline. And I went to the library in, in St. Clair. And there was something, I don't know what it is that appealed to me, but uh, first of all, it was the rhyming pattern. Also, there was many books in this series, so I could visit Madeline in London, and she went on other adventures. And digging into my memory bank when I had to write about this uh, for a course once, Madeline had a, uh, her appendix out, and she had stitches, and I always wanted to have my appendix out. <laughs> so I don't know how Madeline's in my uh, schema, but she is. Uh, Ian, I'm going to invite you to speak first because uh, I, Ian is both an author and an illustrator. I had to choose from a long list to introduce them, but I do have some favorites. You talked about Jungle. Certainly the name of the tree has been on my shelf for many years. Boy of the Deeps. You've illustrated uh, Canadian Railroad Trilogy. Can you talk about the creative process as an author illustrator? I think after... Uh 40 years in the industry, I can kind of do that. Um, there was, in fact, to have been uh, slides, but uh, they haven't materialized yet, so they have them, okay? Uh -huh. But I have the book, too, so I'll hold the book up that I'm going to uh, work from. Great that we can have visuals when we're talking about visuals. I decided visuals. that uh, instead of focusing on a number of books, I would just zero in on one in particular, and it's one of my latest publications, the incredible Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories, which uh, have been published many times since uh, 1902, and many different illustrators have taken that challenge. Um, and, and really, it was a daunting challenge because there were so many beautiful versions of these stories before. I knew I had to bring something distinct to it, and so I, I thought very carefully about the structures of the stories and how they were independent and had to stand firmly on their own, but at the same time, they had to be connected by common threads. 
So I chose four media to work with, watercolor, pencil crayon, pastel pencil, and chalk. And I worked in various combinations, sometimes singularly, sometimes in combinations of two, three, and four. More importantly, I looked at um, the stories and the illustrations in terms of their conceptual nature. Um, it was important to me to understand them and how they ticked. Ultimately, I realized that these Perquat stories were transformative stories. And I wanted that transformation to, be, to appear on the cover of the book. So if you look at the image, you will realize that four of the six animals and the six stories in volume one are positioned here. And you see the animal in the landscape where the story is set. And you see the reflection of the animal in its transformed state. So in the upper right-hand corner, we have the leopard from how the leopard got his spots and his natural, and as Kipling would say, exclusively sandy, yellowish, brownish color. And then in his reflection, you will see leopard as we know him today with those cool spots dappling that hide. We have kangaroo hopping across the Australian outback from the sing-song of the old man kangaroo. Short legs as he hops, but you look at the reflection, you will see the long legs that he is longing for so he can run length and go through the, um, through the landscape. Rhinoceros sits in the Indian Ocean in his pink skin. He has removed that Mac-like coat that he could unbutton back in those days when rhinoceros, rhinoceros were able to do that. And he is sitting in a reflection that looks like one that has been scumbled with cake from the Parsi's Revenge. On the back of the book, you will in fact actually find an um, elephant from the elephant child pre-transformation. There he is with his little boot light -like nose. But look on the reflection, there's the trunk. And down in the lower corner, you will find camel from how the camel got its hump, humpless, and then hump in reflection. Um, the next detail may seem rather insignificant, but in reality, this is one way that an illustrator can distinguish his or her version from all the others that have come before and will ever come from that point on. In the history, in, in um, my research for um, these illustrations, at one point I learned that Roger Kipling, in fact, lived in Brattleboro, Vermont. I thought the guy had lived in England all his life, but he didn't. In 1892, he moved to the US, and in 1893, he and his wife completed the construction of a house that they partly designed, and they lived there until 1896. And I went there deliberately to see if I could find uh, some motif or pattern from a detail in the house that we could use to open and close the stories. Now, I must admit to you that in addition to going there to find this motif, we thought it would be rather cool to eat at Kipling's dining room table and drink scotch in front of his fireplace and sleep or, and take a bath in his tub. Uh, the house is for rent. Anybody can rent it from the Landmark Trust of Great Britain. So the five of those six motifs um, come from an exotic hand-tooled leather trunk that sat in the dining room in Kipling's house. Uh, the sixth one, the butterfly, was one that I just designed thinking it would fit in. But take a look at them. It doesn't fit the character of the other five, and it surely wasn't appropriate. So Michael and I dropped it. Right, Michael? This is the opening uh, story, How the Whale Got His Throat. Um, and in this uh, illustration, I'm illuminating the moment when the, the male mariner, having been swallowed by the great whale, is reconfiguring the raft on which he was sitting and turning it into this great grate, which will stop the whale from swallowing any other mariner. I decided that I could put one detail from each of the images, from each, sorry, from each of the stories in the gullet of the whale. And in particular, I could put the butterfly from the butterfly that stamped. The butterfly that stamped is the 12th story in volume two. And I could take that butterfly, and when the mariner was coughed up on that far shore, the butterfly could also emerge from the dragon, or from the, um, the whale's mouth, and it could flit throughout the stories in between the two volumes until ultimately it got its own story, number 12, the butterfly that stamped. Second story. How the camel got its hump. You see that it's distinctly different in its quality and interpretation than the watercolor pastel pencil and chalk that was used in How the Whale Got Its Throat. This is just chalk and pastel pencil on a very rough watercolor paper. 
And I wanted that electrifying moment when the jinn came and gave the, the um, camel his uh, just reward uh, for his arrogance and to remind him that he would always be a beast of burden. And so in that electrifying moment of jinns creating a great magic, we have just uh, pastel pencil and chalk, and you get to see the inside of a camel, which I think is actually rather interesting. The third story had to be distinct in its own also, and particularly because we've left the African continent. We are no longer um, in the North Atlantic, where how the whale got its throat was set at uh, longitude uh, 50 north and latitude 40 west. This is the story of a, a Parsi who bakes cakes, and one day a cake is stolen by the rhinoceros and he runs off. But several days later, he, the rhinoceros comes back to take a bath in the ocean. And the Parsi realizes his moment when the um, rhinoceros removes his skin, lies it down on the beach, and the Parsi comes and rubs cake into the hide. And I thought it would be rather interesting to take pastel pencils and chalk and draw with it, but also to take the chalk and that pastel pencil and draw, but also rub and scrub just as the Parsi did when he worked the cake into the rhino's hide. So you'll see that the base color is in fact watercolor, and all the chalk and pastel is rubbed over top. The last image that I'm going to share with you comes from how the leopard got its spots. And this moment illuminates the truly magic moment in this story when Ethiopian, having um, transformed himself from the exclusively sandy yellow brownish color of the high veil, turns himself into this glorious blue, black, purple, brown color. And he's ruminating on what he will do to transform leopard. When I came upon this moment and was trying to figure out the answer to where would you start, I ultimately realized that you, if you're going to transform something, you are bringing new life to it. And so you probably begin at the heart. And you bring a new lifeblood to that animal. And so Ethiopian has first touched the leopard just above his heart and is ruminating on where to go next. And I assume that the next step would be right here to give leopard intellect. So the, the rest of my thoughts um, on the creation of this book are in fact in both volumes. You can read them in the illustrator's notes and that came to be because my editor, Pat Zildana, thought this was an important thing to do. So um, there you are, that's my thinking. That's all I got to say. Ian, okay. Thrilling, thrilling. I'm going to buy a copy of that book. Will you autograph it? Sure. I think so. That, absolutely. <laughs> thrilling stuff. Uh, Keo, uh, you have a little bit different perspective because you are an author. I met you in your book the first time, Spork, and you've written about Virginia Woolf, and your new book's looking at me, Julia comma child, brilliant title, Julia Child. So can you talk about the collaboration since you are the verbal artist and the um, illustrator that comes to you? Uh, I can, and I'm just wondering if Julie is here because I wanted to acknowledge Julie Morstead, who's somewhere in this hall, um, the brilliant illustrator of Julia Child. Um, so uh, I, I wish I had visuals to go with what I do. Um, it would bore you. I write the text generally and then I will work on it like over time, and then um, I work with a, a wonderful editor named um, Tara Walker, who's here right now, and um, she always has this kind of intuitive sense of who I would be best paired with as an illustrator. And I have to say that I, I really love collaboration, and I think that we go a certain distance in terms of collaboration when I work with an illustrator. Like, the editing doesn't stop when I hand in the manuscript. There's still versions and passes after the illustrations come in because. Um, Actually, John Klassen said it beautifully. He said the words and text sharpen each other. And I think that you realize that at a certain point, that there's words um, that are, become unnecessary once the images come in. There are, um, you know, anyway, vice versa. But anyway, so there is this past that happens later on, which I really love, because you look at redundancies. And, and it's really a, a point where you see what the images are doing in terms of the storytelling. Um, so that said, oh yeah, there's, there, there's my visual. Um, that said, um, I have been really lucky that I have illustrators who have a really strong sense of metaphoric intuition. And by that, I mean that they don't just come with their images and parrot what the text is saying. They come and they add a whole other layer and often a really surprising layer. For example, in like Virginia Woolf, 
Isabel um, did this little transformational trick with, with the ears. Um, there's a, they're in silhouette, and I don't know if you've seen the book, but towards the end, you discover there's a reveal, and you discover that the ears are actually a bow. Um, and it's a really poignant and very perfect thing that she did. And I didn't write that into the text at all. And um, Julie's done similar things in this book, like with little flourishes. She has this recurring rainbow that I love. It's kind of like trippy, 1960s psychedelia. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of collaboration there. Excellent. We'll come back to you, but thank you very much for that. Um, Michael Solomon, you are an art director at Groundwood. So my question for you, what is an art director? And uh, can you tell us about the process of creating a picture book? Yes, I can. Um, an art director is a visual editor. So I'm in charge of kind of uh, what, what an editor does to the words of the book. I'm in charge of doing the same thing somehow with the art. That is to say, guiding, steering, directing, um, and then at the same time making sure it can physically be printed economically or beautifully in the chosen format. So it's juggling a lot of different uh, uh, aspects, working on one side very closely with the editors and on the other side with production and the printer and making sure everything basically looks as best as it can be and still be um, affordable uh, uh, in the bookstore. Um, I have a few slides that I think... Oh, there? Yep. Oh, there we are. Um, so I won't go through all of them, but I think if I just point to a few, um, uh, some of the recent experiences I've had with pictures and books uh, that have come across my uh, work table. Um, here's an example of just a surprising, in my experience, a new, a new artist, Matt James, who we've only sort of known about for maybe four years. And uh, sometimes we just go out in the world and rest people from their other occupations. He's a painter and a, and a musician, and we just stole him and kidnapped him into the world of uh, illustrating books and matched him with this absolutely gorgeous text by Laurel Croza. And uh, uh, it didn't even, I, the second volume came along, it happened organically. There was never, I think, any intention of making a pair or a or duo, but um, it ended up being like that, very striking, and they've been very, very um, successful, very well received. Um, that the first volume I know here, I'm showing an early iteration, but it by now has, uh, I think even the propeller of the plane is covered up by medals and awards, so uh, it's uh, very little cover left. It might be a bit hard to see, but um, I was just thinking of, um, uh, the, uh, I mentioned page turns and the kind of development of, um, the, your, the, the material means at your disposal, your pen and ink, your watercolor, your oils, whatever you're, whatever you're bringing to your, your pictures, you can make that, you can make a light and a heavy touch really a dramatic part of your presentation. So this is an example of, a, of two contiguous spreads in Sibel Young's um, uh, picture book, um, a few blocks. And uh, you can just see the potential for color is there, but when you go to the second spread, you see this, um, Again, it doesn't answer the entire potential. You go further and further into the book and there's this push and pull of black and white and color, but it's this idea of every page turn explodes the potential for your presentation. It, there's a, uh, I'm really reminded of um, Isabel Arsenault's um, when um, uh, Vanessa paints the garden in, um, uh, in Virginia Woolf. There's that same sense of an explosion, a riot of color that's potentially there from the very begin beginning, but it suddenly it creeps and, and explodes over the page. So that's an, one way of, I uh, always encourage artists to look at the drama of the shape of their format, the page, and think of it as a stage where, you know, you can use the dynamics of the page, very, um, make it integrated with your technique to really bring a lot of expressive uh, to the storytelling. There's the cover. So again, covers, you don't want to give away the whole impact. You want to sum up and somehow point to what the book is about without sort of um, stealing your own thunder. And one of my favorite books, uh, Marie-Louise Gay's Any Questions? Um, again, I just love this um, approach where she's introduced little fictive writers, authors who go on this adventure and they enter into the author's own experience of writing a book and cre the creative process and then halfway through the book they're set loose and I just it's just one of those great um, experiments in metafiction almost and um, really really marvelous this is an example of the story within a story that develops and then the kids themselves are let loose on the story but it's got so many levels and so many um, uh, 
things happening at, uh, in terms of the actual narrative that I think it's really, really a rich, a rich multi-layered uh, book. And sometimes the material means of the original material is what creates the form of the book. I mean, these are, this is City um, Alphabet by Joanne Schwartz and pictures or photographs by Matt Beam. And the book simply took its shape from the 35 millimeter film format. So these weren't digital photographs, they were simply, and I left them completely uncropped because it gave me a repeating uh, strong design. It was followed up by City Numbers. I just repeated the process. We had some fun with the photographic texture in the number. And again, the book, why is it that shape? It's simply that shape because the material sort of dictated. I don't know if that shows up at all, but um, I, uh, this is something that if you're working on a picture book, you, you, really, you, you should get one of these very early because it uh, shows the actual physical book and I really encourage illustrators to be aware of page one to page 32. This is a 60 page um, layout that shows everything that you will, every, all the space available for you to fill. But it goes beyond that because it, it goes outside the narrative and goes from page one to the end. Any, any back matter or apparatus uh, on a, a book that short, you want, uh, a visual book that short, you want to bring your art to every page in the book. So it's really important to think, a lot of people think about their story and they start drawing, but they're never aware of the, the potential for binding cover, jacket, flaps, all of these material aspects of the book uh, are, are, are yours to work on if you have a kind of, uh, you have it in your mind right from the, the beginning. Um, again, this is just a, a really nice recreation. We sometimes bring in books from other countries. The source was from Iran and wonderful um, uh, 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 adult artist um, imitating a child's drawing in a very, very poignant story. But just physically, it didn't match our, our it didn't have enough pages, it didn't have, uh, it, it was saddle bound, so we needed to actually add pages to bring it into a, a marketable 32 page picture book with a hardcover. So we actually ended up having to go in, there was no extra art, so I ended up very sort of uh, diligently trying to find and salvage and reuse material to make a cover and make, uh, the, and stretch the book out to a full uh, 32 pages. And just a little bit about color. This is a, um, uh, Beyond My uh, Hand, a book that just came out this year. Um, gorgeously printed, and again, we had examples of two or three uh, previous editions that were printed elsewhere. So the challenge was to make it look as good as possible. And we, it, we, it's hard to tell from this slide, but uh, really, really fantastically printed book on uncoated paper. Again, just a bit talking about the narrative dynamics again. These are two spreads from uh, Norman Speak with art by uh, 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 Chin Lang. And I just want to, again, showing the potential to break out the voice or the narrative into staccato rhythm on a page rather than everything being a scene. So that within the compass of the same book, you can go from something that's fractured and multiple to a single a scene, which is more what you expect in a, in a picture book. Matt James uh, tackled uh, the song Northwest Passage and um, did a, another sort of remarkable kind of protean poster-like book. And I think I have a cover as well, yeah, the cover for the... Um, so it sets the Stan Rogers song to a wonderful kind of otherworldly portrayal of the Arctic. And again, just an older book, but uh, an example of art by... Um, Baba Wage Diakite, and his medium is ceramic tile. So all of these things are actually painted on glazed ceramic tiles, fired in an oven, and then photographed. And he tells us, uh, t told uh, a series of African spider legends. A spread from a book coming out this spring, a Rosario's Fig Tree. Again, really simple, beautiful, simple art by um, Luc Melançon. And then I just want to talk a little bit about the physical book again, because they, uh, books, despite all the dire prognostications that we're hearing about the book industry, I, I go into a bookstore at this time of year and I'm as excited as ever at the quality, the beauty, the physical presence of, of books. It's, it, thank God they're still you know, making them and doing a, a fantastic job of them. Uh, when we bound up um, 
the sound books into an anthology, the idea, the opportunity was there again to wrap it up like a gift and add things to it. So we threw a bunch of, um, of extras at the cover design just to make it, a, a, so it's not repeating books that are already out there. We gave it a whole new look. And um, there's an example of the, um, that just shows the four color um, composite component. So that's like any book that would be printed on a sheet of paper, laminated and then glued to a and then uh, th that was turned into a metal stamp that was pushed down on that front illustration to make a, a, a recessed area. Foil was stamped, so the type and lettering on the spine was in a metallic. And that's a bit of a mistake. That, should, that shouldn't have the title, but that's um, a spot lamination. So you have gloss versus matte, you have metallic foil, and you have a textural uh, three-dimensional element as well. So that's also some of the things we think about when we're making books, is how to make the final package special, gift-like, desirable. Sorry. Are you fine? I'm done. Thank you very much, Michael. Catherine Cole, you've been a book publisher. You have been an art director. And wearing the hat as editor at Second Story Press. Can you talk about the selection process and what a publisher would look for in a manuscript? Yes. Um, especially with picture books. It's, it's that old expression, I know, I know what I like, not necessarily what I want. Picture books are all over the place, and it really depends on, on what the purpose of the manuscript is, um, how you begin to visualize it. Some picture books are, are for pure enjoyment, which is, I think, the best, best kind of picture book. But others are there as cautionary tales, or to teach a lesson, or to prevent something from happening, or to tell something, uh, a nonfiction um, element to the book. So what I'm looking for when I see any one of those things is, is first of all, has it been done 25 other times? Um, if it has been done before, that subject's been touched upon before, does this bring something unique or different um, to the subject. What I'm also looking for when I, when I am considering picture book manuscripts is, I, I guess probably because of that whole visual thing, and I was a book illustrator a long time ago and an art director, I don't think of picture books in terms of first the manuscript and then the pictures. The minute I start reading that thing, it, it starts to suggest pictures and page breaks and what it could be to me. And I think the most important thing to do when you're considering a manuscript for a picture book is to realize that what you're holding in your hand is a veritable kaleidoscope of possibilities. It's infinite. If I choose this person, it's going to look like this and be fine. But if I choose that person, it's going to look like this and be something entirely different, but probably just as beautiful or stunning or useful or imaginative. So every illustrator can bring something special, hopefully, um, to a book. What I'm looking for when I pair up an illustrator with, with an author is an illustrator who reads the manuscript and says, I love this. There is absolutely no point, in my opinion, for um, an illustrator to spend a year illustrating a book that they really are not sold on, uh, because that will come through. I look for a narrative and storytelling approach, obviously, with the words. Thank you. <laughs> and. Um, um, so that the, the words are telling a good tale or a good point. But what I want from an illustrator is someone who can be faithful to that but take it to another level. And I think, I think Michael touched on that a second ago. That's the narrative quality of the illustrations as well as the narrative quality of the manuscript. And there's no point for them to repeat each other like an echo. Uh, what you really want is a new reverberation sort of echoing off the walls of the book. I want someone who can think of a book not as picture by picture or page by page, but to think of it as a unit and to know that your purpose when you start that first illustration and look at it is to carry the child riding with you, 
from page one to the end and give them something that makes them different for the reading or for the experience of the book. If you don't change a child in some way, even a tiny little way, there's no point in doing that book. So bringing just a new thought into his head or a new realization into his head or a spark of imagination into her head is, is what picture books are about. And um, without that, I, I, I don't think there's any point in coming to the table. Um, when I think of picture books and start reading a manuscript, I automatically find the page breaks where I would feel like I could make a picture here and lead someone to the next spread. Um, so the pictures begin suggesting themselves. I do like a narrative quality that, that brings um, another element of the story without interfering with what the author said. I like picture book manuscripts with a sense of humor, but never, never laughing at a child. Um, I think children sense that quickly. I think they resent it thoroughly. I used to, when I was a kid, when the author did a little sly nod and wink to the adult reading the book, no. But to write a book on two levels so that the author, the author is talking to two different audiences is, is a real art. Because the adult reading the picture book to the child, if that adult is enjoying it on a level that's, that's richer for the adult experience, and the child is enjoying it for his own sort of contextual experience, then you've got a real gem. And then everyone gets a chance to laugh, everyone gets a chance to enjoy. But I hate books that that take advantage of a child's limited time on earth, basically. Not, not limited intelligence, but limited experience, and, and use that against them. Because nothing kills the desire to read quicker than, than laughing at somebody. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, we'll push that further a bit. I, in my course when I teach children's literature, I don't know where this statement came from, but. I argue that every time we open up a picture book, we're taking them to the art gallery. So there is the visual, but also with picture books, we can take them to the whole world. And from a classroom teacher's perspective, we can bring the whole world into our classroom. So you've touched on some points. I'll let anybody answer. What do you think makes a picture book successful then, uh, both from an artist's point of view or a publisher? Anybody can answer that question. Um, I know personally what really works for me is when I feel like a, a spell has been cast, like where there's a sense of enchantment and I, and they're, and this is what I love about picture books is that they're kind of modest and miniature form but that you can imbue them with so much emotion and I think that the, the feeling like of a singular mood or atmosphere sustained throughout the book with maybe a little transformation really works for me. Um, the other thing is what everyone's kind of described as the page turn is the, dr the kind of drama of the page turn which can work as a punchline or as, I mean, that's like an incredibly beautiful thing. And um, some books like, can completely work on that principle alone, like Remy um, Charlotte, who does fortunately, unfortunately, you know, the, where every page is like a different kind of like up or down in the narrative. Um, and I really, I love that kind of thing. Um, but really, it's a spell for me. I think the spell is important, and, and certainly Catherine talked a bit about this. It's that magic coming together, words and pictures. And I love those moments when I'm reading both words and images, and I r realize that I can't imagine any other vision for this book, that the illustrator has just hit the nail right on the head, and I wouldn't replace that illustrator because this is so stunningly beautiful, but the illustrator really has heard the voice of the writer, which is unique, and the voice of the story is unique. And the illustrator has recognized his or her responsibility to the story first. I've always believed that the responsibility of the illustrator is, is first to the, to the um, story, second to the writer, then to the publisher and reader. But, but really, when, when the illustrator captures that uh, text, it, it is utter magic. I would just um, also say I, I was inspired by um, some of Catherine's remarks about the um, sensitivity of the author to a child's nature. Um, and I think that's a, a very important thing. And I think something like wit 
and panache belongs to authors who are so much masters of their material, illustrators and authors, that they can do that kind of, they wear their learning, they wear the history so lightly, it, it imbues the text, the te it, it's there for the child, and there may be another nuanced layer for the adult, and it all comes, it's all from one um, perfect work of art. There's, not, there's no straining, no one has to groan at a pun, no one has to, you know, um, be condescended to, uh, it's all very, very, Airily, lightly carried off. I think. It, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's sort of like a. I keep coming back to the idea of we've all mentioned theater and stage. It's something about a theatrical presentation within the compass of those covers. I think when I when I first became aware of the power of a story on two levels, it was um, when I read my favorite uh, storybook to my own children and as an adult, and it was Charlotte's Web, which I had adored as a child. But when I read it as an adult, I couldn't get, I couldn't get past certain pages. I kept bursting into tears because I was getting it on that other level. And, and I had never really revisited the book since I was a child. And I can remember my kids looking at me with a mix of wonder and horror on their faces as I sat there bawling. And they were just, they were just getting the story and uh, not all of that other adult garbage that we, we pick up along the way. But I think that's what makes a book like that still uh, work. And uh, when you can do that for a child and an adult, obviously they feel the connection between each other. It's why books haven't yet totally, picture books haven't gone totally digital because that physical connection of a child sitting with you or close to you is, is um, I hate to use the word precious because precious is precious, but it's something that's invaluable and, and it's almost like an electric current. So when the adult is enjoying, so is the kid and vice versa. Um, I, did, I did early picture books. I don't know if any of you remember Phoebe Gilman. I know some of you do out there. Um, but she was a master of visual page turners, um, and she was a good storyteller too. And I think when you, it's rare when you get an illustrator who becomes a good author. It usually works that way. The illustrator begins to think, okay, I can, I can write my own stories too, um, rather than a, an author becoming an illustrator. But it's rare when you get a uh, person who can be both really, really well, but when you do get that, you have something very special. Phoebe was one of the early Canadian storytellers who was one of those people, um, and, I, and I always look for that. I think one of the questions on our list is, how does um, an author who wants to be their own illustrator present? Well, you present what you have. You present what you do well. If, if you really are trained and you're a visual thinker and you have a sense of design and text and you know the um, sort of physical parameters of how to make a book, why not show it to somebody? <coughs> Excuse me, and do it, do it um, in an uninhibited way. But it's just not that many people who, who have the whole package. Catherine, we couldn't have pl planned this better because you talked about e-reading. An article in the New York Times, is e-reading story time or simply screen time? And Michael, you um, alluded it to as well. What do you think the future of picture books is? They talk about uh, Clifford and you get the, all the bells and whistles and you hear the dog barking on screen. I would argue, obviously, it is a different experience, but it's a reality that we're heading into. So talk about the picture book as you see it in the future, and then we'll have a question or two from the audience. Are you looking at me? Anybody? Um, I'm, I don't think we are, um, our picture books are simply at this stage for the tablet, and they are pretty well an electronic um, replication of what you see. They have Apple's own additional um, magic sort of page turning effect, but beyond that, we haven't been adding any um, Apart from uh, 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 voice narration, we haven't been adding any sort of new content just because it's another leap into a whole, uh, we feel that that's a second kind of medium that we're not, uh, we're still making these, uh, the book comes first, these are a representation of the book. 
uh, we expect people to have both the book and the tablet is for the road trip. The book is on your shelf. And I think that's um, my own experience with them is that they, they're brilliant, they're backlit, and it's all kind of slightly glitzy and fake because I always run back to the book and see that's how it's meant to be. But there's, nothing, there's also something very um, intoxicating about the sharp detail, the fact that you can zoom in and see things. So they're both really good adjuncts, especially that whole idea of the picture book as an as a art gallery for the, the, the young audience. Um, my own, I mean, I'm, I only read um, electronic books dutifully. I have done it. I've read model length um, or novel length um, uh, books on the e-reader, but my whole, I'm not a natural e-reader because my um, inevitable response as I'm reading is something along the lines of, uh, this is really good. I should get this. <laughs> then I realize, oh, I already have it. But no, I think I should really get this book. So, um, and I suppose maybe that's, that's probably good for business if more people had that attitude. But um, anyway. Uh. Um, <laughs> I don't think that, first of all, I don't think the technology for picture books is quite there yet um, to become something different from what the book can, can bring you. Um, there's still difficulty. So, big deal, you can make the dog bark in one corner or something, nod its head, or, or a character run off the screen. Um, to me, I think for children, they still equate that to a computer game or a TV show, where when they've seen it once, they're not going to want to revisit it. But we all know that a good book, you, you've seen that commercial on television where the baby yells again, again, and, and that's what happens when a child relates to book in print. For some reason, it's a different experience. And they develop their favorite books that you have to read 35 times and again and again and again. And I don't think digital um, technology is doing that for kids now. I still think they equate it to those other, other um, digital games and things that they're looking at. And um, I think until the technology can bring an added dimension to the story and bring magic of some, you know, the kind of magic we're talking about in good illustration, until there's another element to add there, I don't really think it's going to replace the book. And interestingly enough, sales figures on digital picture books, um, I, I think, are, are telling that tale quite plainly. And it'd be interesting when we do this panel in 20 years how we'll be answering that question. But I thought it was food for thought because that article interested me. We do have time for a few questions before we finish off. If anybody from the audience does, we, yes? Is that the actual story or is that from the front of the cover to the back? Uh, not the cover, but the, the front. Sorry. For 32 pages, yes. is that the actual story? Uh, yes. No, sorry, it's not. It's the whole book. It's, say, for instance, uh, two, two sheets of paper folded eight times to get two 16-page signatures. So your title page, your copyright page, uh, dedication, author's note, uh, any other index, glossary, all of that stuff has to come out. And that, that can squeeze your book, and then you can go to a next size. You can go to a larger book. Yes, typically. Starting on page four is a very common... Uh, picture book for when it's only 36 pages. It can be as short as 24 and as long as uh, it can go up to 60 pages or more depending on the, um, you know, the sweep of the story. The question was, if you as an author present something and the publisher matches you up with an illustrator that doesn't match, what would you do then? Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't match. Um, speaking as a publisher, I would listen to the author. Um, it's, it's the author's book, and their name is going to go on it, but I would try to determine you know, what the problem was um, because if I have chosen somebody there, obviously I have reasons to think that's going to be a marketable match and, and um, a satisfactory match. We might be able to negotiate out of that. 
Um, if I have already contacted the illustrator and given my word, we're into a um, difficult situation. But normally what I would do with picture book um, manuscripts and authors is I usually feel people out and say, I'm thinking of this person, go to the website, look at the stuff and tell me what you think. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, hi there. I was wondering if you want to submit a book to a publisher, um, are there better times of the year to submit a book? And does that vary from country to country? Thank you. I, there used to be better times, but now really we're busy. We're busy pretty much throughout the year. I, we used to look at summer as a slow time and catching up time. Um, I don't think anybody has a slow summer anymore. Um, there are times of the year that, that are busier than others. Fall is very busy, um, both promoting new books and, and preparing um, the spring list, but also there are things like the um, Writers Reserve grants that we're all looking at manuscripts and, and giving grants to or not giving grants to. Um, and so I, I, I would say probably January to March is a fairly, fairly good time. Um, really, there's no, no awful time to be, we get them all the time and, and just sort of keep them flowing. The problem is people aren't prepared to wait for the kind of time we need um, to go over. And I understand the impatience and the anxiety but um, we, we, well, I'm working at a smaller press now. We still get quite a hefty number of manuscripts, but I used to get around 3,000 manuscripts a year, and there was just no way I could keep ahead of that. I'd fall asleep with brown envelopes on my face and wake up in the morning thinking, what time is it? And um, um, you just cannot keep that in a timely way because you wear out. So. We, di we generally, in, in larger houses that are getting um, lots and lots of manuscripts, we have readers who screen, they know what the publisher's mandate is. I would recommend before you send, before anybody sends a manuscript to anyone, for goodness sake, go on their website, get their catalog, do a little bit of homework, because publishers have separate and special specific mandates. Second Story Press has a very clear-cut mandate. And um, there's just no point in sending us certain kinds of books and tying up your work that way. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome to ask any one-on-one -on -one questions when we're finished. Uh, Keo and Ian will be signing their books uh, up on the table behind us as well. And I do want to thank, us, uh, thank my presenters, uh, Keo and Catherine and Ian and Michael for helping us look at the art of the picture book. And the word inspire is just sailing above your head, ladies and gentlemen. And one last shout out, hooray for the Canadian Children's Book Center who organized this event. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, can I just add one thing, which is that Julia Morstead, the illustrator of Julia Child, is here to sign with me. So I hope you'll come over and meet us. <laughs>